Hey everyone, welcome to another homework walkthrough video. This is homework four. And for problem one, it's about Henry's Law. It's very straightforward. So if you do have any questions, please send me an email or use Piazza. Problem two is from the textbook and it's problem 6.5, which is right here. And it says, consider steady one dimensional diffusion. So steady 1D and its diffusion through a funnel of varying cross section. And unlike a tube of cro constant cross-section, the concentration varies non-linearly with the distance. Okay. So for A, it says, neglect chemical reactions and convection and derive the following material balance for steady, again, steady, one-dimensional diffusion through a region of varying cross-section. Okay. And it's telling us to integrate this equation right here and explain briefly what the result indicates. So before we get started, let, let's talk about what's really happening here. So we have diffusion. So we have diffusion. And what is diffusion driven by? It's driven by fixed law of diffusion, right? Fixed law of diffusion. And that's defined as J, A, B, um, J, A, not B, J, A, in X direction because it's a flux, right? So not only for it fixed, we now have, we describe the molecule or whatever is being moved. And then we also talk about the direction. So two subscripts. Then we have the negative DAB. So the diff diffusion coefficient times our gradient DCA over the direction of flux, which is DX. Right, so this is what drives diffusion here. This is the same as how Fourier's was driving con uh, conduction. So we need to also kind of see the patterns of everything we've been doing in this class. So then, how do we go about deriving this material balance? I guess they do give us this result here, but how can we get this result? What is this result? Well, ultimately, it is conservation. We got this from the conservation and it looks like conservation because we have a DDX, we can see a direction and it's equal to zero, meaning steady state. So let's go about deriving this. And let's start always, right? Always we're starting from zero is equal to, which is a steady state. We need to understand, well, we always talked about diffusion as what? Diffusion, con conduction, it's all flux times cross-sectional area. It's flux times cross-sectional area at the inlet and at the outlet, in minus out. So let's write that out. So we have our flux in, flux in, times our cross-sectional area at the inlet in minus J A X plus delta X um, times AC at X plus delta X, right? So ultimately, this is the saying something in minus something out. And, and what is going in and out here? It is the flux of moles of something moles, right? So we need to also understand that we're not talking about concentration here. We're talking about the in and out of moles, okay? And we'll go over that in another homework question coming soon, okay? Coming up very soon. So what's the next step? Well, we need to divide by the shell volume. And what is the shell volume? Well, the volume um, and can be approximated because we're talking about a very small change in delta X. It can be just assumed as the cross-sectional area times delta X, okay? So that's what we're going to use as our volume, okay? So then that means that when we divide all of this by volume, um, I'll move it here. We will get the following. We will get the following. Zero is equal to one over AC. And then it's going to be times JAX times AC, and all of this right here. And 
you might wonder why why is it that the cross-sectional areas didn't cancel out why is that not the case well the reason for that is because our cross-sectional area is changing that is the key part so we need to know that our cross-sectional area here is changing but that's a good thing because then it allows us to be able to take the next step which is what what do we do after dividing by volume we always take the limit as whatever is in our denominator goes to zero, okay? So you'll notice a slight different result here, and it's going to be interesting. So let's take the limit then as delta x goes to zero. That means we will have, first we're going to have a negative, so I'm going to put the negative here already. And then we have a negative because we have the in minus out, right? But if it was out minus in, we wouldn't have a negative. Same thing we've seen last quarter and this quarter. It would be d j a of x times a c over dx. And then we can move all of this over to the other side. And that gives us what? What does that give us? This gives us. All right, running out of space here. DJX times cross-sectional area. So the DDX of all of that is equal to zero. And you can see this is the same result as we got over here. So we just did this material balance. We derived it. Great. And you might be wondering, well, over here it says N, right? So if it says N... Why does it say J over here? Well, the thing is, N, as we know, N has also convection. Convection along with our diffusion. Okay, that's N. And N is for the number of moles, the flux of moles. So we need to also understand uh, that's due to convection and diffusion. But when we only have Diffusion, as it says in the prompt, that we neglect convection. Sure, it's fine to use J. Okay. So we should be aware of what J means versus N. Okay. And one more thing to note here that is we're not done. Now it says we need to integrate this equation. And at least for this question, I will go all the way through because it's important to talk about our result here. So that means when we integrate both sides, move the dx over, take the integral, right, on both sides. Well, over here, we're going to get jx times ac. And over on this side, we're going to get c1. We're going to get some constant. So what does this result mean? Well, let's move it over to the other side. Now, what does this result mean? This result means that the flux, the flux due to diffusion, right? Let's do this, right? As AC, as our cross-sectional area gets bigger, what happens to our flux? Well, it's in the denominator. So of course, flux is going to go down. And likewise, if our cross-sectional area gets smaller, our flux goes higher. And we also saw this in 325 when we talked about fluid flow, when our radius of our inlet outlet got smaller, right? Like this, right? We're talking about this. And we know there's higher flux here, right? Or a higher velocity here. And why is that? Why is that? Ultimately, it's because of our conservation, okay? We said that whatever's going in and whatever's going out, there's going to be zero accumulation, okay? That's why, that's why. So that's why we know that the flux decreases as our cross-sectional area gets bigger, okay? So this should be the result we get. And then let's move on to part B. 
So <clears throat> part B says the radius varies linearly with distance along the funnel and given this formula. And now it says use Fick's law and use the result from part A and equation 6.12.2, so this one over here, to show that the steady state flux is this, right? This right here, all right? And we want to show this by using these boundary conditions, okay? So let's just start by writing what it said to start with. Use fixed law. So let's write fixed law, jaxx equal to negative dab times dca over dx. Great. Now let's also write our result from part A, which is j a of x is equal to c1. And it's clear here, this is c1, it's just a constant. It's not concentration. c1 time or divided by ac. Great. So when we get started here, we can already see, well, we have a jx, jx. So it's pretty clear that we should plug this, plug this into here or, or the other way, it doesn't matter. Set them equal to each other. And then what? And then it looks like we have a cross-sectional area right here. Well, we're also given what? We're given radius here. We're given a radius. So of course we can use a radius to find an area, right? And especially one that is a funnel because what is a funnel? We all know what a funnel looks like, right? A funnel, Looks like this, right? I mean, there's one right here too, right? And it's rotated about the x-axis, right? So what is this? This, the cross-sectional area of this funnel is going to be a circle pi r squared. Pi r squared with changing radius. Great. So that means we can now plug everything in and set them equal to each other. So DAB, DCA, DX is equal to C1 over, let's see, pi, pi, R naught times one plus X, oops plus x over l, and all of that is squared. All of that is squared. Okay, great. So now we have this, but before we keep going, before we keep going, and this is really important to practice this kind of thinking on your own is, where am I going with this? What am I trying to find, right? What, what is the goal of all of this? Well, let's go back to the question. The question said that I need to, or we need to, show that the steady state flux is this, right? We need to show that this is the steady state flux, okay? But what we're where we're going here, we have nothing about flux here. There's no flux. I don't see any J here. I mean, maybe the J from earlier, but that doesn't help us. If we, if we just use this up here, that doesn't help us find J A of X because we still have the C1, right? So, what is going on here? What are we trying to find? Well, let's remember what flux is, right? So n i of x is equal to here, j a of x, because we don't have any con convection. And that means j a of x is just equal to the diffusion term. So by fixed law, it is dab times dca, dca over dx, one dimensional. Right, and now we can see, wait, you know, I, I see a DCA here. This is just the constant, so it's fine. And it also has the D here too, so that's fine. I notice they just use IJ here. I, I've been switching between A and D, so maybe I should I should write A here, okay? Just so I'm clear. Should not be switching back and forth. 
Okay, so then we can see here that DCA DX, I need DCA DX. So if I solve for DCA DX, then I can just plug it in here, right? Well, not quite, right? Not yet, because we also then take a look at the boundary conditions. What boundary conditions do I have? Well, these are all boundary conditions that give me the specific concentration, not DC DX, not the slope, but the concentrations at given points, which means that instead of using DCA DX, I can use CAX, right? So what is CA of X, right? And to find exactly what CA of X is, I need to use the boundary conditions. Use the boundary conditions for that concentration. Then I can then take the derivative and find what is DCA DX. Okay, so we have to go back up and then go back down. Okay. And then we can plug it in here and then we can solve for our flux. Okay. Our flux, our steady state flux. Okay. So that's for question two. It's really important that we're able to create this kind of roadmap, that we're able to understand where we're going, that we're not just plugging and chugging without having a direction. Okay. We also should know what the point of this question is, what it's really asking, and the necessary steps to get there. Okay. That, that's really, it's an important skill in last quarter as well as in this quarter. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next question. All right. Let's move on to homework question three. So I know for this homework, you all can choose just completing three out of four of the questions, but I really do recommend this question. And I mean, coming from being a student in this class two years ago, I would definitely skip this question because it's, it's the most challenging, I'd say. It makes you think a lot. But as a TA, and after TAing this class last year, this problem really will help solidify your concepts in conservation. I really believe so. So I really do recommend giving this question a shot. Give it a chance because it will really, it, it helps you connect everything all together in a unique way, okay? So let's get started. So we have nitric oxide, abbreviated as NO, no. So it's a little confusing there, but NO. And then blah, 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 blah. Okay, we want to examine the transport of a gas through an alveolus and into the capillaries. And then, okay, we don't need to know that. Then we need to first examine the impact of the diffusion time on the transfer of NO from the alveolus into the blood, okay? So we're using spherical coordinates, okay? And it says here, using dimensionless concentration, dimensionless time plot. And that's right here. I displayed it right here. So dimensionless position, right? R over R and then normalized concentration, okay? So show that the gas diffuses quickly enough that this process is not limited by diffusion within the gas space, okay? And the plot is found here uh, on page 08, but it is right here. And it's given some assumptions. We're given some assumptions, okay? So let's actually take a look. So, Problems involving unsteady diffusion. Unsteady diffusion, right? It just means that this term is not zero. Is that they can be solved in a manner analogous to that of uh, rectangular coordinates. Okay, so consider unsteady diffusion in a sphere of radius r. And initially, the concentration is uniform at C0. So when we, when we do this, let's actually try to break this apart and really understand that what this is saying here. First, right, we know, we know what? This is diffusion, this is diffusion. And this is what the question was talking about. We're just talking about diffusion here. So we have diffusion here and it makes sense. This is what? This is this, it's just this, right? Right, it's our diffusion term, um, square, right? It's our diffusion term. 
So let's let's not be too confused by what this is saying here. Then we have our sphere. Okay, and I'm I'm modeling this in rectangular, but you can imagine it's a sphere like this, right? And this is our center. Okay. So this is our center. And this is our blood, right? This is the alveol uh, blood. Right. So let's think about this. Well, if r over r is 0, 0.0 and r over r is 1.0, and I'm looking right here, 0, 0.0. 1.0. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, let's say, right, that my radius is 10, right? 10 centimeters, 10 meters, whatever, right? 10. Well, when my radius, when the radius that I'm analyzing this at, if I'm looking at r equals zero, so the center, it's going to be 0.0. .0. And if I'm at the edge of my radius at 10, it's going to be one. It's going to be one. So ultimately, we're just seeing this as the position with our radius. Okay. Then, then what? Then halfway in, right? It would be 0 0.52, right? Because it would be 5 over 10. Okay. So that's all that that is saying. Then what about our concentration, our normalized concentration? Well, we're given that our concentration, normalized concentration is equal to C, the concentration at that point, minus C naught, the initial concentration, over C1 minus C0. And what is happening here, it says, is that time zero, the concentration at the surface is raised to C1, okay? So that's where this C1 is. And C1, it's raised to C1. Oh, it's raised to C1 here, right? So if it's C1 over here, then what is this? C1 over C0, C1 over C0 is just 1, 1. And does that match over here? Absolutely. It's 1, right? It's 1. Then what about on the left-hand side at the center? Well, it's C minus C0 over C1 minus C0. Well. Then at time zero, it's going to be at time zero, right? At time zero. At time zero, it's going to be C naught. And C naught minus C naught is zero, right? Zero over something, which is zero. So what's happening here is the concentration is dropping, right? There is flux. Flux of what? Flux of concentration? No. Flux of moles. Flux of moles, mass transport, transport, right? So we need to understand what is going on here, okay? So what does normalized concentration really mean? This, this right here, what does it mean? C minus E naught over C1 minus C0. Well, normalized concentration. It just means, right? It's the percent change of the set change. The set change is C1 minus C0. That's just the set change. And then we're seeing how much of that is changing, the percent, right? Well, here it's, it's 0%, and here it's 100%, which we would expect because we're changing it literally here, and we're seeing with, the, with respect to this, what's the change, okay? All right. So that's all that that's saying. So now here, let's go back to the question now that we've really understood what this plot is showing, right? Then it's saying, show that the gas diffuses quickly, that it's not limited by diffusion, okay? So this is showing diffusion again here. And what is the parameter changing in this? What is the parameter changing? Why do we have all of these different lines? What What is, what is this? Ultimately, right, ultimately, it's right here. Dij times t, don't forget the t, I know it's hidden there, but it's there over r squared, okay? Dij t over r squared, okay? And let's actually write this for what it is. Here we're looking at NO, DNO, right? 
So this is a dimensionless parameter. And you can check this by checking the units. They should all cancel out. So then what does this mean? This means that our diffusion, right? How well something diffuses depends on this dimensionless parameter. And if you actually look at the book notes uh, right after this introduction, you can see how they derive this dimensionless parameter and how how it comes from this okay how it comes from this so understand that this dimensionless parameter is for this function is for this function which is a function of diffusion diffusion and let's remember dimensionless parameters those kinds of things we talked about it in 325 when we did buckingham pi buckingham pi we did it to remember that we did this to group variables together to see the change right? Across a smaller subset of variables. So what does this mean? This means that if I impact any of these variables, so let's say I have a higher diffusion coefficient. If I have a higher diffusion coefficient, what's going to happen? I'm going to have better diffusion, right? So if I used to have a diffusion coefficient and this whole parameter was equal to 0 0.05, if I increased it, what happens, right? What happens? Then I have better diffusion. I have about 55%, right? Or 0 0.5 coming to the inner radius, right? Does that make sense? Then I have better, right, diffusion. Okay. Or let's say I have a bigger radius. If I have a bigger radius, then this whole parameter value goes down. Then if I had this kind of diffusion, but I had a bigger radius, then my value goes down, right? And guess what? Right over here, this, this also shows that it's at a concentration of zero, at back, back to zero, right? Back to C naught, right? It's not diffusing all the way. So that's very diffusion limited, right? It's very diffusion limited. So this is diffusion limiting, right? Or let's say I had more time for diffusion. Let's say I, I'm allowing diffusion to occur for longer, right? That means, again, I'm going to have this diffusion initially. I'm just, again, I'm just making this up over here on this plot. It could be any of these lines. I'm just showing the increase, right? This increase here. If I have more time for diffusion, that means this parameter value goes up. That means we're on this line over here or this line, any of these lines. And that means that we have better improved diffusion, okay? So that's what this plot is saying, but ultimately that makes sense. So now let's keep looking. And over here on this dimensionless parameter, we need to ask ourselves, well, we have, we have a lot of different variables over here but we also are given them right here. We're also given radius. We have the diffusion coefficient. Again, it's also reinforcing that um, the initial concentration is C naught. Then what? That's all we need here, except time. You know, what is time? What is time? We need to understand that what is going on here? What is going on here? What process is this where we have nitric oxide, right? Entering what through how long, right? It's, it's really similar to some of the homework problems we've seen. This is the time you need to estimate, estimate. So hopefully that's a hint for you. But my challenge for you is let's say you use a different time, right? Let's say you use, okay, I won't say exactly what times you can use, but my question is, does the exact time really matter? Maybe really matter here? Does it really matter here? That's my question. Does the exact time really matter for what dimensionless parameter number you get? So try it out and make sure we convert all of our units to the same, okay? So in the end, it's good practice to 
it's good practice to always convert to meters. But in this case, as long as the top and bottom, all of those are the same units and they cancel out, that's fine too, because it is a dimensionless parameter, okay? All right, let's move on to the next part. All right, let's continue. So part B is talking about so because diffusion inside the alveolus has almost no impact, well, that's the, a hint to the answer. Assume that the gas in each alveolus is separated from the blood by a membrane through which the NO diffuses. So let's be clear that now we're talking about some membrane, right? So it's not only just the alveoli anymore, but there's also a membrane. And this is a, this is a sphere. Um, I don't know if I can, I'm not very good at drawing, as you can tell. But it's a sphere, okay? It's a sphere. And, <laughs> and now the outer surface is held at blood concentration NO, while the inner surface has a concentration of CM of T. So now we can see that there's a function CM of T. And before, we need to understand that CM of T is what? It's the concentration at the inner inner membrane, inner surface of the membrane, not of the membrane itself, but of the inner surface. So think about also when we did our ComSol homework for our homework two, we checked, we put like a probe and saw the temperature change over time at that position, which is exactly something similar to this function. Okay. And it decreases with time. It decreases with time as gas is absorbed through the membrane into the blood. So we can solve this problem as a time-dependent first ODE, and we're given it here, okay? Where beta is determined from the alveolar radius, membrane thickness, and diffusion coefficient of NO, okay? So this is just the components of beta, but that doesn't mean we can just write it out, say beta is equal to all these things. No, it, we can use this, but we don't know that if it's actually equal, okay? So note that you will need to find the volume surface ratio of the alveolus because the volume determines how much NO is left and the surface area determines how fast NO is leaving the alveolus into the blood. And this sentence right here, this sentence is definitely a big hint, right? It, it, it tells us we need these values for some reason. And that's for you to think, okay? Now, the real question here is what fraction of the initial concentration of NO is left? in each alveolus after each breath, and we're given some values, okay? So before we get started, before we get started, we can see that there is an ODE, right? We can solve this problem as a time-dependent first-order differential equation. So let's write that out. DCM T over DT plus beta CM of T is equal to zero. And right away we're like, oh, this 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 really looks like a bio heat transfer equation. We've seen these kinds of equations before, but no, this is different, different than transfer equations. Transfer. Oops, transfer equations. And why? Why is that? Because it is a time time derivative. And we can see here, right? This is time and time, right? We're talking about time here. So how do we do this ODE? How, how do we solve for it? Well, here we use a Laplace transform, okay? It's a shortcut, but yeah, Laplace transform. Use Laplace transform. And we all should know this from math 207. And then you should show your work, show work for credit, right? For credit, always show your work. And your solution should be CM. And we already know when we look at this um, ODE, we've seen this kind of ODE so many times and we know the solution, but still you should show your work with a Laplace transform. It's going to equal our initial condition, CM of zero, which means not at radius zero, but at time zero of our inner membrane times E to the negative beta T. Okay, that's what it means. And now our first intuition is to find CM of zero. But 
do we really have to find CM of zero? And this is where we need to really understand what the question is asking at. Again, before we head in the wrong direction, we should always stop and think, where am I going? What am I doing? What is the purpose of doing this? Okay, well, let's double check and let's, let's, let's create a roadmap. So we have, we have an ODE, right? So we were given an ODE of inner NO concentration, concentration. Then we just found, and which you all will show the work for, we found the function of the inner and inner membrane, right? So um, this inner NO concentration. So we just found this, right? But now let's let's remember what we're solving for here. We are asked to find the fraction of the initial concentration, okay? Initial concentration of NO left in each alveolus, okay? So that means we need to find, right? And I'm going to leave some space here. We need to find fraction of breath to initial of inner and O concentration. Okay. Then, well, we already know the initial, right? We know it's CM of zero, right? That means we need to find our inner concentration at T is equal to breadth, right? This part right here, we need to find that. So find inner NO concentration at T equals breadth, T equals breadth, right? Well, then let's think about it. So we have breadth over initial, is equal to, and we have our equation right here, CM naught or CM of zero, E negative beta T over, and we know it's also CM of zero, but also it's CM zero, E negative beta zero, right? And this simplifies to one. And we can see here CM zero, CM zero, they cancel out. So do we actually need to find CM of zero? No, we don't because it cancels out anyway. So that would be additional time going in the wrong direction that can be prevented by creating a roadmap and knowing what we're solving for here. So the answer is no, we don't need to find CM of zero, right? And that means, that means we just need to find, in order to solve this, we need to find beta for CM of T, right? But there's one more, there's one more. I thought I gave myself enough space. One more, one more step. The question is, how do we solve for beta? How do we solve for beta, okay? That's an open-ended question here, really quickly, okay? So before we continue and start doing all different types of algebraic manipulation to try to find beta, which it will be impossible to do, we need to understand what are we really doing here? Always, you know, the questions I always ask for these kinds of questions, whether it's through office hours, whether it's in quiz section, whether it's through these videos, we always need to ask, what are we really doing here? What, what is this problem really about? So I really, I really encourage you all to ask yourselves these questions as you do these problems. So the first one, what are we really doing here? And this is similar to the previous homework video. I am leaving these open-ended, okay? What is this problem really about, okay? And I guess, I guess I'll, I'll briefly answer, maybe give, give you a good start to thinking about this. What is this problem really about? This problem is about 
right? It's about transport. It's about transport. We're 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 talking about diffusion, transport, right? And then you need to ask yourself, transport of what? We're talking about the transport of not concentration, never concentration. We're talking about the transport of moles, moles of NO, moles of NO. So let's go back down. We know that we are talking about transport. Okay, transport is one. And it the second part, it's about moles, transport of moles. Okay, so we should really be clear. And then another sub question, right? So I'm giving you this roadmap of how to think about any question you're approaching. Then you need to be able to challenge yourself to think in this way. Well, then if we're talking about transport, what types? And as you can see, this is the exact same thinking we did for heat transfer. What types of heat transport? Transfer. What types? Well, we have flux, right? We have flux. We have flux, which is given by fixed law of diffusion. JNO is equal to negative DNO. And how do I know there's flux? Because of the first question too. And the whole question talks about So I didn't finish this. So here, it's really, really easy to not write fix correctly. It's really important. It's really easy. One big mistake is to write CM because we're so used to writing CM. But no, we are talking about, remember, CM is at the position of the inner membrane. We're talking about CNO, right? The concentration profile of NO across the membrane which means we're talking about in the direction of radius. That means I should have a radius subscript here. This is really, really important. Really, really important. I cannot emphasize this enough. We need to understand the direction and what we're transporting through, okay? Then, is that it? No, we actually have another form. We have another form of transport, right? And I, I call this a form of transport. It's not really transport, but it is, right? And that is accumulation. And how do we know that it's accumulation? How do we know it's accumulation? Well, it's really easy, right? We have CM of T, CM of T, right? And we need to remember, you know, that this is a time function, time function describing the concentration at a certain point. So that means it's not a steady state, it's changing. What does this remind us of? In bioheat transfer, it reminds us of what? Of T of T. And you're like, oh, wait, wait, we haven't talked about T. What is T of T? What? I've never heard of T of T before. This is the temperature at a given time point. That's all it is. It's how the temperature of an object of a point is changing by time. That's what it's talking about. So then, so then, what did this look like? Well, it looked like dt over dt, our accumulation term. That's what it is, right? That's all that it is. Then, what does it look like for cm of t? It's going to be dcm over dt, okay? dcm t over dt, because that is... What? That is our accumulation term. That is our accumulation term. And this is the time that you need to ask yourself, where have I seen this in an expression, right? And when have I seen the flux? Four years, right? And then the real kind of thing that brings everything together is moles. We need to remember that in the end, we don't talk about the flux of concentration ever. Because why? Because concentration is what? It's given in molarity, right? Molar. And we know concentration is equal to what? What is it equal to? Concentration is equal to moles over volume. 
And here we should be like, oh my gosh, when else have we divided something by volume? When else have we divided something by volume? It is Q. It's equal to big Q over volume. Q is not flux. Notice, because there's no subscript. And big Q, right? Big Q is not Q dot. It's not Q dot, right? It's not Q dot. This is from what? This is from when we did our Q is equal to MC P delta T, right? But here's the, here's the real thing we need to consider, right? When we did Q is equal to MCP delta T and we found DQ over DT is equal to rho CP DT DT, right? Yeah, we did it that way in um, week three of quiz section and we substituted it in. We talked about how we talked about how these terms, the units match up and the conservation of energy, how we can use it to plug it in there. But in week four of this course, we talked about what? We talked about deriving, right? This from the beginning, we talked about deriving it from the beginning in conservation of energy. We talked about using conservation of energy and writing what? Rho CP, right? Rho V CP, volume, not velocity, volume DT, right? And then, right? Of, and then the convection term had a, had a velocity term on top of that, right? But the thing is, then what? And then it was equal to dot, 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 everything else, right? It was equal to everything else. Then what? Then we divided all terms by the shell volume. Then we got what? Rho CP dt dt, which is then equal to dq dt, right? But let me ask you, in this term, what was it actually? What was what was rho v c p d t d t, right? If we didn't divide by volume, right? This is what. This is big Q, big Q over d t. Then when we divide by volume, we get little Q, right? So when we did conservation of energy, we weren't talking about just the per volume, right? We were talking about the big Q, the big Q, right? In the same way, right? In the same way, when we write for conservation, right? Our, our statement for DC, we're so used to writing DCA, DT. We talked about how they look so similar, right? But the thing is, it's not the conservation of concentration. It's not the con conservation of concentration. What is this really? What is this really? This really is the concentration of moles. It's the concentration of moles. So when we talk about biomass transfer, you know, molar transfer, it's all about the conservation of moles. Okay. So again, this is these are some questions you need to ask, right? Some more questions, some more open-ended questions. And I, I did pretty much answer these ones. Okay. So these are the questions you want to ask yourself. Where have we seen this? Where have we seen this before? Okay, you need to ask yourself and make these kinds of connections, right? Make these kinds of connections. Then, what expression? Do we write? Right? Then you need to ask yourself, you know, is this is this shell balance? Is this shell balance? And sometimes your answer will be yes. But let's talk about this question. Is this shell balance? The answer is no. Why? Why is it not shell balance? Because you know, in shell balance, what's the point of shell balance? We do shell balance to find anything, right? Concentration, 
temperature, right? Shear stress, velocity. We try to find these at a given spatial, spatial point, right? So we are not, we are not finding, finding, not CM of O, C N O of, not of T, but of R, right? We're not finding that. We're not finding this of the membrane. We are finding CM of T at that given point, right? It's a time function. It's a time function, you know, of the concentration of NO at the inner membrane, okay? So we need to know that we're not finding the spatial position change. We're just talking about one singular point and the time. So it's not shell balance, but it is something that we use in shell balance. That's my hint. It's something that we absolutely do use in shell balance. And this is my final question. You should always be asking yourself how this all connects to everything. You know, what is the core principle that we have been learning in 325 plus 335. So both of our courses. What is really the core principle that we've been really talking about all this time? All this time. And, and here's my final hint, right? Here's my final hint. And this it's pertinent to this question. So these questions, always be asking all these in the red. Ask yourself these questions whenever you have a problem, whenever you're approaching anything. Ask yourself, where have I seen this before? What expression are we trying to write here? What is the core principle that we have been learning? What does this really connect to, right? So the final hint, don't, don't just solve. Don't just try to solve for beta, okay? Think about the above questions, right? Write the, write the expressions. Beta will ultimately, right? It will solve for itself. Okay, it will solve for itself. Once you consider all these questions, write the expression that really unifies all of this that we've been talking about. I did not write this here for no reason, okay? I want you all to think, why is this on the screen right here? Why are we talking about the different types of transport? Why are we talking about, why are we talking about this, right? This is a huge, huge takeaway here, right here, okay? What is it really saying, right? What is this step? Okay. What is this step? I know that this is this is a really challenging question to think about, but I already I, after talking to some students, you know, after leading them through these exact same questions, huge light bulb moments. And I know you can too. Okay. So really push yourself to connect everything we've learned up to this point for this question. I really, really challenge you. Talk to a friend, talk to the TAs, try to think about it, bounce ideas back and forth. Then that's where true learning occurs not through just by following these, this video, not by just copying an answer. It's really by self thinking, being able to connect all the dots together. Okay. Let's move on to the last question. All right. So let's start with question four. So this is about doing problem 7.2 from the textbook. And there's also example 7.1 and it goes through the derivation of the Peclet number. Okay. And again, it says the derivations are not required, but are recommended as practice. I do recommend them. And again, the textbook, it looks really bad here. So you can barely read any of this, but I will not go over it personally, but it does talk about it here. One more note to add is that it gives you this graph on the Peclet number. And then there's actually an additional portion in the textbook that um, continues off the example. Okay, so make sure you're scrolling all the way down because this is the equation we need right here. And it's impossible to read here, so I will rewrite it out. But this is the equation we need at the very, very bottom, okay? So let's read question 7.2. 
we're given the definition of a perm of permeability across in rectangular. Okay. C naught is the solute concentration, Cl is the concentration of the lymph, and L is the thickness, and assume Cl is equal to zero. Okay. Use this definition of the permeability and the flux across the membrane, where fluid flows across the membrane. Um, our partition coefficient is equal to one, and then find an expression for the permeability. So we need an expression for permeability, which is right here, right, right here. And what are we using? Well, we are using this definition from the textbook. So please go and look at that and find it too. I will rewrite it here just because I know it is hard to read. So we have um, the flux. Uh, this includes both convective and diffusion, right? And I in the Z direction. So of solute I in the Z direction, we should know what these subscripts mean. Solute I in the Z direction is equal to the negative Diffusion coefficient of I in J, right? In sol um, solvent J, DCI over DZ, direction of flux, right? Plus CI times VF, okay? CI times VF, right? And that's the concentration times our filtration velocity, okay? Filtration velocity. And it's equal to what? It's equal to the partition coefficient and this, this does not require any derivation, right? This is our basic core concept, right? We, we've seen this before. Velocity times, you know, our concentration. It's equal to the partition coefficient of our diffusion coefficient over L. L is the thickness. And then we have pecklet number, pecklet number. All of it times, and I am out of space. Great. One second. Pecklet number times C naught minus C naught minus C L over one minus E to the pecklet. Okay, E to the pecklet. Okay, okay, I made it. So essentially, we are going to be what? We're going to be plugging in this right into here. And we're like, oh, which one, the left or the right? Well, it's pretty obvious, right? We want to put in the right side because we're also given the partition coefficient, okay? So you can plug in one for the partition coefficient. Then you also need to simplify. So this, this question is very easy, okay? It's just deriving um, permeability, okay, from our flux. That's all this is. Then let's move on to part B. Part B is talking about the diffusion limited transport when pecklet number goes to zero, that the permeability, this is the permeability, is equal to D over L, Dij over L, okay? Now, it also says, note that exponent um, is equal to one plus X. And you can also test this out yourself. Um, you know, if, if you go, if you plug in on your calculator, um, E 0 0.00001, I mean, it, it works for smaller numbers too, but this, it shows very easily. 1.000, um, it's zero, 01. Okay, so it's one plus whatever it's adding on. And of course, this is still pecklet number. So it's one, one plus pecklet number. Okay, so that's what this is saying right here. Right here. Okay, so just a, just a good thing to know. So it's asking us, well, when um, pecklet goes to zero, when pecklet goes to zero, right, permeability, show that permeability becomes D, I, and J over L, okay? Well, then use this expression that you just derived here, okay? Use it here, oh, the new one, right? After you simplified it. And then you're going to, right? Then um, plug in, right? Whatever you get right here for the exponent, right? For the E pecla, right? Which is Obviously, it's just going to be one plus one plus PL. Okay, right. Then you're going to plug that in. And then what you want to do again, you still want to take the limit as pecklet goes to zero. Okay. And then you will find that it was this. Okay. Then you'll then you'll get to show that it is equal to this. 
Okay. Again, it's it's not too challenging. It's it's just kind of understanding what happens here. But for part C, this is where we connect it all together. It we connect it all together. Okay. Find the error that would result in the calculated permeability if convection was neglected as a transport mechanism. What does that mean? So that means if one situation, we don't have convection, meaning we only have diffusion, right? We only have diffusion. And the other one, we have both convection and diffusion, okay? So let's remember, let's let's recall here, what is pecklet number? This is where we actually need pecklet number. It's, it's the filtration velocity times the length right, times the thickness of the membrane over the DEF, okay? Diffusion, right, diffusion coefficient. So let's think about this. Well, we were so easy, we said so easily, you know, in diffusion limited transport, pecklet is zero. What does that even mean? Well, that means that, you know, if our filtration velocity, right, goes down to zero, right, it gets smaller, Pecklet, right, also goes down to zero, right? It goes down to zero. So what does that mean? That means that we, pretty much pecklet number, as it gets smaller, it means that there's more diffusion, right? There's more diffusive, diffusive forces rather than convective forces, right? On the other hand, if we have an increase in velocity, that means what? We have an increase in pecklet number. So that's higher pecklet number, right? It's really important to know that. Then, right, let's remember, we just talked about this. We were able to find the permeability, right? And you should show your work here. But we found the permeability for diffusion limited. So we'll write diffusion here. Diffusion, right? It is going to be PI permeability is DIJ over L. Right. Then what about for convection? Convective, right? Convective. Then, well, convective. Um, let's see if I have a good place to write this. I'll go here. Convective and convective plus diffusive. Huh, <laughs> diffusive. Oops. I'll just write diffusion. Is what? It's the permeability from Part A, it's just from part A, whatever whatever we solve for here, okay? So whatever you got for, from part A, okay? Part A, okay? So then that's where you can use these values, right? Use these values in your pecklet, also in your um, um, diffusion and convective plus diffusion expressions, okay? Then, it's asking us find the error, right? So we know how to find the error. It's going to say, right? And let's make sure it's it's clear what the error is. Result in the calculated perme permeability if convection were neglected. So that means it's only diffusion, right? Is the change minus the normal, with, which is convective or convection plus diffusion right, over the normal convection and diffusion, right? And to get a percent error, multiply it by 100%, okay? That's how we can get a percent error is equal to something, okay? And that is your answer for part C. So I know this homework is definitely more challenging than our previous homework. Uh, I'd say the previous homework was a little... Um, easier than the usual homework. So we're kind of back at that same level. But this homework is really important to understand pecklet number. It's really un important to understand everything and especially homework question three, understanding how we can connect mass transport with bioheat transport, with momentum transport. It's really important that we're always thinking about the previous concepts we've learned because they all tie into together. They all tie in together into conservation, okay? So thanks for watching. Good luck with the homework. Always happy to help uh, over email. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.